Good morning. Welcome everyone. We'll just wait while everybody joins. People are still coming through the door. Welcome everybody. So we'll be recording this session uh, for those who are unable to join us this morning. Still seeing our numbers going up. Okay. Welcome everybody <clears throat> as we settle in. So good morning. Um, this, uh, this session is going to be recorded, as I mentioned. Um, my name is Ruth thomas Gwantz, and I'm the Senior Director of Field Building at the Build Healthy Places Network. And um, welcome to this webinar, uh, which is to give you some more information about our request for proposals for the Community Innovations for Racial Equity. Next slide. So um, just to give you a bit of a background, if anybody's not familiar with Build Healthy Places Network, uh, we're a national nonprofit. Uh, we work at the intersection of community development, healthcare, and public health, and really with the intention to create some momentum to accelerate the investments that these sectors can make in partnership to speed and spread solutions, building health and inclusive communities where everyone gets uh, an opportunity to thrive. Next slide. So our um, simple agenda today is um, we're going to, after our welcome, we'll do a brief description of the community innovations for racial equity and walk through some of the eligibility and guidelines. Uh, we'll have a description of awardee commitment and how to apply for this um, uh, RFP and then open it up to questions and answers at the end. And it's great to see you all introducing yourself. It's good to see such a, a wonderful representation from all across the country. Um, so um, to start us off, um, and, and a very quick get to know you uh, for folks in the call, could you answer this quick polling question? So does your organization currently have a partnership with a healthcare entity? And by that, we mean a hospital, it could be an insurer or a public health department or an institution. And so I'll just give you a couple of minute, couple of uh, minutes to uh, fill in that poll. Does your organization currently have a partnership with healthcare? Okay. All right. So if we can see the results coming in. Oh, we have 72% have a, um, some form of relationship or partnership with healthcare and 28% who are interested in having that, that partnership. That's great. So thank you for sharing that information this morning. So um, next slide. So um, to give an overview of the community innovations uh, for racial equity, um, as some of you are familiar with our organization might know, BHPN just completed a pilot program that was similar to this um, community innovations on a smaller scale. And what's slightly different with this current program is that there is an explicit commitment to directly addressing racial inequity. And so this initiative will focus on building local um, black indigenous and people of color led community development capacity. And the work is really driven by the acknowledgement that BIPOC led organizations have to overcome systemic racism to advance their work. And in particular, our approach will focus on supporting community power and to explore innovations in community ownership models and tied into that context of community development and health partnerships that have potential to really advance racial equity and health equity across the country. Next slide. So um, to open the door and clear communication, we'll, um, oh, sorry. Um, I think I went, through some of this oh no I didn't I didn't talk about this sorry so facilitate we want to facilitate connections and deepen existing connections between community uh, led uh, community development corporations um, advancing neighborhood revitalization revitalization efforts and other uh, also creating um, peer networks with other organizations and providing tools and large uh, uh, and dialogue 
connecting to the larger national dialogue. So um, we'll be embedding within these organizations to undertake community ownership models, as I described, um, and to really uh, create a position of strength um, to engage in a, a strategy to approach health organizations. And as I, as I said earlier, be that hospitals, healthcare systems, insurers, or um, public health entities. And, and the whole goal is to champion race con con uh, conscious partnerships, uh, policies, approaches, and investments and to really um, magnify their impacts. Um, next slide, please. So, um, so in support of clear communication um, that will define some of the key terms that are used in the RFP and in, this, in the particular context of this RFP, RFP um, first up is um, the term BIPOC-led. And so we're using this as a self-identified term BHPN will be relying on your own definition of what it means to be BIPOC led. Um, there are different definitions. You know, some people feel that it comes from the CEO, OD, or from the board. This is your definition. Um, community Development Corporation, uh, for those that may not be familiar, it's nonprofit, community based organizations. They're focused on revitalizing the areas in which they're located. And they typically work in count, uh, to counter the significant disinvestments that are experienced in some communities, typically low income, underserved, and often communities of color. So CDCs develop and manage affordable housing. They can um, build grocery stores in food deserts, community centers, engaged in workforce development programs, comprehensive childcare, education facilities, support of small businesses, and other social services to re neighborhood residents. And we say this because there's obviously that important distinction of the important work that folks do in community development as an activity. And this RFP is really targeting the sector that works on this kind of infrastructure and workforce development as listed above. So last but not least, um, the definition of racial equity. Um, um, and in a nutshell, uh, one where persons of community outcome, um, persons or a community's outcomes and well-being are no longer being predicted by their racial identity. So we use this term as part of the continuum with racial justice, and this includes um, root causes of practices, attitudes, culture messages that reinforce the systemic racism that creates differential outcomes by race or conversely fails to do anything to eliminate them. So in the context of the RFP, Community Innovations for Racial Equity is, de is defined as work that is prioritized, inclusive process to eliminate disparities and improve outcomes for communities of color. Next slide. Um, now, there are many valuable ways to work on root causes of racial equity. And for the sake of this RFP, we're focusing on creating partnerships with health that deepen impact through upstream investments in what we call the social determinants of health, which you can see in the, uh, illustrated in this slide. Um, so social determinants of health, for those not familiar with it, are essentially all those factors outside of the clinical delivery system that are gonna impact health. That can be access to food, stable housing, transportation, employment, childcare. And I'll briefly, um, distinguish then on this slide that between the kinds of investments in clinical needs and social needs and those of social determinants of health, which can also be, you'll see, um, abbreviated SDOH. So the clinical needs are considered downstream investments at the point of clinical care and access to care. And social needs focus on elements that are outside of clinical care, such as, you know, do you have healthy food at home? What is your housing situation? <clears throat> Excuse me. And these needs are increasingly being screened for at doctor's offices um, with the end goal then of connecting an individual with services or a case manager or navigators that can connect them to the needed services. And all these impact at that central um, zone there, the individual level. So connecting a person to what they need. Upstream investments in social determinants of health are really aimed at impacting the whole community at one time. They are looking at what is, is the availability of safe and affordable housing in the community. Are there grocery stores within the community? And so by changing the infrastructure of that community, the idea is that you're preventing that pipeline to downstream impact uh, on the individual. 
you're connecting all the individuals in the community to an environment that condition that and, and conditions that really support healthy choices and options. So these interventions could present as changes in policies or system approaches that change the ways uh, housing, education, and economic systems approach work, and that impacts the health of communities. Um, and the challenge we're trying to solve in the next slide, please. Um, is that this all has a pretty big price tag, the $1 trillion problem, because with all of that we know of all these factors that have big impacts on health, how do we manage diabetes, for example, if you don't have access to healthy care or you don't have access to regular consistent food? Despite all that information, our healthcare system annually spends more than a trillion dollars, often treating preventable conditions that we know, know, that we know sorry, um, are caused by essentially by poverty and all that that entails. And this can be anything from frequent flyer, flyer, um, frequent users of emergency services. It can be those suffering from preventable or chronic conditions that are influenced by um, where they live. Um, and as one physician on a panel I was with um, that was about um, national cancer screening said, um, cancer screen is one thing, but these po folks have a lot of other stuff going on. And so it's about minimizing that other stuff that allows you to focus on your health. So healthcare has been making progress, uh, connecting the people they de that um, deliver medical services, connecting them to other services to address social needs. And outside of that, while some are beginning to see that it serves their ends to impact housing or other social determinants of health, they often don't really know how to go about that. And they don't know, if, for example, about housing, nor do they really need to, since that there's an entire sector that focuses on working on that. So the opportunity that we're looking at is about unlocking the money to address social determinants of health by creating ready partnerships to guide those investments in communities that need them. And our, our work at BHPN really centers at this point. And so how can we change the calculation to invest more deeply in social determinants of health and changing health for the whole community rather than one individual at a time? How can we really leverage this point of influence in addition to advance racial equity across the country? So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Colleen Flynn, who will take you through a few more details about what this um, opportunity involves. Thank you, Ruth. Hi, everyone. I'm Kyle, Colleen Flynn, and I'm the Senior Director of National Programs for Build Healthy Places Network. Delighted to be here and share this opportunity with all of you. I have noticed that some folks have already started to put um, questions in the Q&A chat. Please continue to do that. We'll have a whole uh, time period to go over those questions and answer them and just add questions. We, we really want to be here to help support the process of deciding if this is a good opportunity for you. So what is the opportunity? This would be an 18th month uh, engagement uh, available for up to 10 eligible organizations. And I will go over eligibility again soon. I know that that's some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, awards are up to $40,000. And this is either just to support your staff time of an organization to work with us, or you can hire a consultant to help lead your healthcare engagement. And we will be putting together a consultant pool of BIPOC consultants to help support this effort if, if organizations are interested. And then there's our in-kind technical support. So Build Healthy Places Network will be there to provide technical assistance, capacity building support, sharing our tools and resources, being um, also a, a broker and some connections with healthcare entities that we might have contacts at. And then, um, as we mentioned, one goal is to help facilitate uh, peer support and networking on a national level. Um, so a little bit about our technical assistance that we provide is we have a whole process of doing a landscape analysis if awardees are interested. And what we do there is we figure out your catchment area, the community you're working in, and help go through a process of analyzing the inequities in that area, mapping out where the healthcare ecosystem are, those partners where they are, what are those healthcare systems pain points, um, incentives and motivations for potentially partnering, what other initiatives are going on in your community that might well align. And the whole goal of that landscape analysis is to figure out shared goals and priorities 
with healthcare partners in your community to help make the case. And then we go through a whole process of helping with the case making, helping to make a pitch. Um, we broker those connections, as I was mentioning. We have a ton of tools and resources and case studies on our website that we can explore. As Ruth mentioned, we'll be helping to think about guiding through community ownership models and community led models or supporting ones you already have in place uh, to strengthen them. And then we'll provide trainings on topics that the awardees and the cohort would like uh, to would like to learn more about. And so um, all of that will happen within the 18 month time frame. So eligibility, one is that uh, you do need to be a 5013C organization. Two, as we talked about um, BIPOC led CDC, so Ruth already went into the definition of what a community development corporation is. We do wanna open it up um, to be inclusive that you don't necessarily have to be considered a community development corporation, but what you do need to be is a BIPOC-led nonprofit organization, a member that self-identified BIPOC-led, so however you identify that. Um, that is, but this nonprofit does need to be revitalizing historically marginalized communities through local investing and development. So still the same idea where you're helping to develop and preserve affordable housing. I know some groups are really into uh, working on community land trusts. That would be interesting. Anything that's where we're thinking about that's community led, that's community ownership models. So basically focusing on the same type of bricks and mortar work in a neighborhood, grocery stores, community centers. Um, you just might not be officially a community development corporation. We do wanna work with organizations that are having explicit focus on racial equity. And as Ruth mentioned, are moving, you know, trying to move upstream. So move away from just individual social services into a whole community approach on investment. Um, and you know that you're committed to partnering with us to advance your collaboration with healthcare. And we wanna, we wanna keep this open to everyone. So if you do not have a healthcare partnership currently and want to start that process, that works for this grant application. We're happy to start wherever you are in your journey with your healthcare engagement. Um, as we mentioned, we would want some dedicated staff time to work with us and that's what the $40,000 can cover. And we wanna make sure that we have leadership buy-in. So there is a, a letter of support uh, that comes with the application from your CEO, executive director, president of your board. Um, and we have a template for that. So we're trying to make this as easy as possible to apply. That's on our website for the RFP. Um, and this is just a little bit more about the commitment so that you'll, that the organizations will work on projects with us that are advancing racial equity with healthcare. We already mentioned the dedicated staff person. There'll be a uh, assessment done pre and post our engagement because we wanna see how much um, learning has happened, what challenges have come up, what are some best practices. Um, we mentioned you might be able to hire a local consultant if you'd like to that will be training folks to do that work. And then um, we will be creating a, a peer learning cohort, exciting, hopefully from all over the country. And so we'll have some Zoom salons and webinars and technical assistance meetings that will largely be localized and crafted by the folks that are part of the cohort. So how to apply. One is, um, you know, go to our webpage for that, which we'll, we'll provide in a follow-up email. There's an application template that you can download. The first step in that application template is just some general information about your organization, the project scope, some a little bit of information about your community profile. Um, you will be asked to fill out some questions and a lot of these questions can be pretty short answers that are largely in line with our principles for building healthy and prosperous communities, which I'll go over in a moment. Step four is to attach that letter of support I mentioned. And then the last step is to um, submit the proposal by March 18th. And there's a, an email address th in the template um, to submit. It's, it's a proposals email address. So really quickly, um, through dedicated research and reviewing various different organizations, vision and mission statements, we came up with um, kind of the North Star of these principles for how to build healthy and prosperous communities. The first principle is to collaborate with the community. Second one is to really embed equity. One is that 
we believe it's important to mobilize across different sectors to create cross-sector partnerships. Four is around increasing prosperity to improve health. A lot of that's around thinking about how to create generational wealth opportunities for historically marginalized communities. And then the last commitment is over the long term. So how can we create sustainability in the projects and work that we're doing together? So the key dates. So the, the RFP was released this month, February 3rd. We have having an informational webinar right now. Um, applications are due March 18th. Awards will be announced sometime in April. And then the official start date of the project is May 1st and the project will end at the end of October in 2023. Um, so now it's time to open it up for, for questions. So I see that we have a bunch of questions um, Ruth, I don't know if you want to join me in answering some of these. Um, so I think we, some of these questions maybe we answered, but there's one question, is this opportunity for CDCs only? For example, could a resident group that is advocating for equitable development apply? Um, so I think if your organization is a nonprofit, 5013C, and you are advocating and thinking about implementing um, some type of neighborhood revitalization projects, and I would say yes. Um, the next one, and then I'll hand it over to Ruth, is would a patient support and advocacy organization be eligible for this? I think the answer is most likely no, um, because it sounds like that organization is more thinking about social services support. Um, and again, this is thinking about moving more upstream and thinking about holistic community development work. Um, it might be interesting to try to partner with a community development organization and, and, and apply together if you can find an organization in your community, which could be an interesting idea. Um, right. So there's, the next question is um, someone who represents a network of CDCs um, moved up. Um, a network of CDCs and health partners that are BIPOC led uh, that would be interested in partnering across a multi neighborhood geography and would that be eligible we had multiples yes we mm -hmm. would we would we would love right. to work with multiple cdcs that are working with health partners i think that would be a really interesting project yes and um the next question is as an organization um is it necessary necessary to already have the association with the medical entity before you start to apply and that's no really Exactly, Ruth. Yeah, the, no. in, the intention can be if you're, I think what's required is that you would like to form a health partnership. And part of this process will be helping you think about how to do that, including who's in your um, in your uh, ecosystem and geography that that you would approach. So um, I can take the next one. Yeah. Um, read the letter of support from leadership. What if the applicant is the org's president? Good question, Suzanne. Uh, I think we'd still like to have a letter of support. Again, we have the template online, so it really shouldn't take much time. And we just want to have everyone have complete applications from the start. Um, I can take the next one. Would an organization that focuses on the advancement of BIPOC youth through mentorship and programming be eligible? I think that organization by itself, I would say no, unless yes. you also do community development work like build affordable housing or grocery stores or, um, or so I think it would need to be again in partnership potentially with a community development corporation or uh, a nonprofit that's doing that type of bricks and mortar work in a community. Right, Ruth? Yes, I agree. Um, you uh, you mentioned somebody mentioned uh, you mentioned five one c threes are eligible. Does that include small private foundations? I think the answer I'm there sure. is probably no. no. Yeah, yeah, I think um, because we're looking for again nonprofits that are working on uh, developing affordable housing, managing that housing, community land trust, um, co op grocery stores, and things like that. So I think a foundation probably would not be the right entity to apply. Right. Oh, and uh, next question is from a familiar name, Zachary. Um, who decides who the awarders will be? Colleen, Good you know question, the process. Zachary. Um, so we've created an advisory committee, um, which we can share and follow up email. 
And the advisory committee is made up primarily of um, BIPOC uh, organizations and people that represent different sectors. So we have healthcare represented, community development represented, some more kind of organizations that do community led and community ownership models, um, some organizations that represent large, uh, one organization that's a African-American CDFI Alliance. Uh, so it's a, it's a good scale, uh, hospital associations. So they will helping us select and we will we have criteria we are using that largely follow the principles we mentioned earlier and they're all around this idea of equity and uh and racial equity in particular right i'm just going to chime in there's a couple that are in the actual chat and those questions we are an education fund nonprofit, and we're looking at applying for this for our teacher diversity initiative and the project would be specifically community-based action research would our project be eligible? Or are you looking strictly for healthcare type projects? Um, I think if it's um, community-based action, action research in itself would not be eligible. It would be more the investment um, and the infrastructure change that might result from that is, is the project that would be um, eligible. Um, if you have a cross-sectoral collaborative, but not a 501c3 yet, how could we apply as a collaborative? Would we need to run it through our individual hospitals or our community foundations 501c3? I'm not sure I understand that. Does, do you get that, Colleen? Yeah, maybe repeat the question one more time. We have a cross-sectoral collaborative, but not a 501c3 yet, so they don't have that designation, but how could we apply as a collaborative? And, or would, would they need to run it through our individual hospitals or our community foundations 501c3? I think in order to apply, one does need to be a 5013c, just the way that our organization is set up. We are part of Public Health Institute. Um, so unfortunately, I think your organization does need to be designated as a 5013c. Okay. Is that all the questions in the chat? Should I go back to uh, the okay. um, uh, what are you, what if you're in the middle of making a housing cooperative that wants to focus on 200 people living in in their units that are all BIPOC? That project sounds like the exact type of project we would want to work on as long as you're a nonprofit and you're working on those types of neighborhood revitalization efforts in your community. Um, I would say yes, definitely the type of project. Yeah. We would work on. With an interest to partner with a health entity. Yes. Yeah. So I think those are answering it. and I'm going to answer somebody asked for an example project, um, but I'm going to try and I'll put something in the chat from the uh, Renee's blog. So I'll maybe go to the questions. Okay. Can you give examples of the type of outcomes you anticipate or what is being measured through the pre and post assessment? Good question. Uh, it's mostly just around um, your readiness to partner with healthcare. So how has the journey with Build Healthy Places Network and the partners we bring in and the expertise we bring in from multi-sectors, how has that helped create more readiness for your organization to be able to partner with healthcare? Um, and you know, what have your organization, what have you learned in that journey? So hopefully that answers the question. The next one is, we are a community development organization and work on creative placemaking, which is the intersection of art and culture for economic development. Do we need partner? So that's a great, uh, Jean, I love the place facing work you're doing and definitely are eligible um, to apply for this grant. I think the only thing you would need to desire to do is to desire to partner with healthcare. Again, that could be public health, that could be a federally qualified health center, that could be a health plan, a private insurer, a host local hospital. So with that desire to partner on your art and culture for economic development. And we actually have a playbook all around economic development that um, we can share after the yeah. webinar as well. Yeah, take a note of that. Um, Next one is parent support group for nonprofit organization can apply. Um, again, I think if mm -hmm. that's such a noble activity to be working on, I think if your nonprofit does, as we were talking about community development type work, building affordable housing or economic development work, 
um, workforce development, um, then yes, if it's just a parent support group, unfortunately, uh, it doesn't meet our eligibility for this grant opportunity. Um, will a letter of support from medical entities suffice? Currently, we have no formalized partnership, but have collaborated in a number of health initiatives with a particular health center. Um, so yeah, to be clear, you don't actually have to have a partner uh, established. Um, so a letter of support is great, but you don't you don't actually need to have that to um, be a successful candidate. Um, developing the partnership is something you can do through the program. Yes, and the letter of support is just from your organization, from your your CEO or president of the board, saying that uh, that that you're interested in applying and committed to um, committed to working with us over the eighteen month period. Would a 5013C working on food access initiatives such as creating and developing neighborhood food pantries be eligible? Um, Suzanne, I think it's great that you're 5013C. Working on food access is definitely part of um, the community development ecosystem. Um, I think it would just be a matter of if you're also working on other type of neighborhood revitalization effort projects, if that's the only, the only, your only kind of type of project, or if you're thinking about the holistic community and affordable housing or community centers or grocery stores. Um, so the next question says, in, in the RFP, it notes priority will be given to rural, tribal, and small to mid-sized communities that have been marginalized or have had less access to resources. Can you give us some more additional information on how you define these communities? Thank you. Um, okay. Do you want to take that, Colleen? I um, I, if you have an answer for, I mean, I think that's a really good question. It is. Um, I think you know um, what we're trying to do by including that is um, to really make sure that we have robust sort of representation from those who are doing this kind of work not the not the type of work being different but the location of the work being in rural or on tribal lands um sometimes small to mid-sized cities that sort of community development corporations that have historically um had a harder time accessing capital and resources to be able to do their work uh, and so th i think um that line is really just about um ensuring that there's representation and that they're not overlooked as, as in terms of um resources. Colleen, anything you want to add to that? Yes, it doesn't negate if you're from a large urban area, um, we are also looking at those applications. It's just that um, we have noticed over the, our time of working at the network and being, um, being an established organization that there's less national tools and resources that trickle down to smaller and mid-sized cities and rural and tribal areas. So we're just trying to make sure um, that there's special attention pay, paid to those communities. Okay, How are you just... going to select the 10 organizations from the pool of applicants? Um, that, again, we have an advisory council that's on the RFP webpage that will also send everyone in a follow-up email. And we were largely basing it off those principles we went over earlier in the webinar. Um, and it's all around equity. It's all about thinking about how is your organization collaborating with the community in a meaningful way that gives community voice and power, that thinks about um, strategies that bring forth race conscious partnerships, that thinks about long-term sustainability. And so there's criteria we're using um, around those principles, around the questions you'll be answering with this advisory council. Um, sorry, I'm trying to, there's questions coming at all, all angles, which is great. I know that's what we want for this. Uh, there's some in the chat, um, but would a nonprofit organization that provides life skills, education, after school programs, job training, mental health awareness, and CBT qualify. Um, again, I think that that, um, that that would not really qualify if it's in terms of services and individual needs. If it's about infrastructure change, um, workforce development, you know, the kinds of things that we've described um, in partnership, um, that might be eligible. 
but as it stands, I think no. Uh, can you partner with multiple healthcare organizations? Uh, absolutely. For example, an FQHC in a large hospital and clinic system, yes. And as I said, so you may already have those multiple um, collaborations going. Um, if you don't, that's okay too. Um, that's part of what we will help you find. I'll take the next one. Can you explain how a community land trust might be a program you would help fund? So I think in that example, if you're a community development or organization or a community development like organization, and you're helping to formulate a community land trust, that would be a project where we could aim to bring in healthcare into that project to help fund that, to help advocate for that if there's policy changes that need to happen. So we would be funding staff time to, for you to work with us to establish those partnerships with healthcare. And then the goal with bringing healthcare in is that we're hoping they will co-invest in a project like a community land trust. And we actually have an article on our website about how healthcare has been involved in community land trusts helping to, in some cases, provide the land, helping to advocate with a county and city entities that we can also share. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Ruth, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. About no, the I think that's good, it's about the process, yeah. I'm just gonna answer one quick one at the end. It says, how many organizations do you expect to apply for the grant and will preference be given to organizations who've worked with you in the past? Um, for the last time that we had an RFP, I think we got about 90 applicants is that correct yes. um so hopefully something at least in the same region and there isn't a preference for anybody that's worked with us in the past that's not really a factor um, we have a cross-sectoral collaborative and would like to apply would we use one of the partners 5013c such as our ventura community county community foundation or one of the health hospital partners we have an indigenous population that we are focused on um, again, I would say this sounds like uh, a really interesting product project that's cost cross sectoral um, and the, the organization that would need to apply again would need to be a Community development organization um, so 5013 C is great and it would need to be a nonprofit that's focused on Community development work. Would housing counseling agencies be eligible for this opportunity? Joseph, I think the answer again, as Ruth was explaining that that's more social services. So it probably would not qualify unless you partner with an organization that's doing more of the community development infrastructure work. Okay, maybe you wanna take this one that's asking a little more about the TA um, support and what that will look like regarding the other in kind resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so besides the landscape analysis and the help with the pitch deck, um, we also will be doing, as I mentioned, um, salons on topics that the cohort would like more information about. So that could be different types of community led approaches, community ownership models, could be understanding the healthcare ecosystem a bit more and doing a focused conversation around that and bringing in some of our healthcare partners to explain all the jargon that's used and how healthcare systems are motivated. Um, we also help with thinking through um, brokering those connections. So in a lot of times we found the challenges just making sure you're talking to the right people at a healthcare system. So not necessarily just the community benefit people, but the senior leadership that really uh, is in charge of making decisions and can shake free, hopefully some treasure dollars so that they can really co-invest with community development. So we provide some support on that side as well. Um, also support in thinking about community engagement models. So it's really meeting the organization where the organization is and how we can be most helpful to move partnerships forward and thinking about advancing racial equity. Um, we'll take the next one. We are an association of CBOs that are Latino led or Latino serving. We do cross sectorial sectional work and have built a Latinx health equity alliance across five counties with local health networks. We provide technical assistance and capacity building to small newly starting BIPOC organizations. We help them develop 
um, as part of the local support infrastructure, would we be eligible? Um, no, not really. I mean, sorry, you're going to say I, I was no. going to say not really, uh, Gabriella, I think, again, this is super important work. Um, but it's a different type of, of racial equity work that is not um, building um, actual infrastructure, environmental, um, you know, buildings, resources in terms of uh, what a community development corporation would do. So I would say no. Um, we have a nonprofit 513 of large healthcare systems, payers, FQHCs and large business to reduce cancer mortality, reduce it with an emphasis on reducing racial and geographic inequities in specific regions, would this, would this be eligible? Um, again, no, if it's, um, you know, this is uh, about um, uh, clinical access and service, which is super important, but not uh, community de development infrastructure change, um, then I would not say that that would be eligible. And Zachary has one more question. Can multiple organizations partner for this application? Yes, definitely. Just need to make sure that you have um, a community development organization or like community development organization involved. What if your organization has multiple projects focused on health equity? Could we submit multiple applications for each? Um, well, I mean, I don't think we can stop you. <laughs> um, but again, as long as they meet the criteria of um, it being from a, a 501c3 with the Community Development Corporation as the as the applicant with an with a, an intent to partner with a health uh, entity, um, I think that's that's what we'd be looking for. Um, Any guidelines on the types of communities you are looking for, such as urban rural size? Um, yeah, I think I think the aim is that we want to support a diversity of different types of communities. So it can be urban, rural, tribal, smaller, mid-sized city. Um, the main emphasis is on persistently marginalized communities that predominantly are people of color. Um, that's the real emphasis here, I think, right, Ruth? Yes, absolutely. Um, so would a BIPOC nonprofit urban farm building a winter greenhouse for community use be eligible or need to be a bigger development or initiative or more healthcare focused? Um, so I think, uh, so the idea with something like that is that if you're partnering with perhaps a community development corporation um, that is, you know, changing infrastructure and building, and then you want healthcare to invest in that or to partner in some way. Um, that's the kind of intersection that we're talking about. Um, I can say that, yes, you know, that kind of project is the sort of thing that a, a, a healthcare system, a, a local hospital may be interested in if it's changing food access for a community. Um, but in terms of aligning your um, application, I think you would need a, a 501c3 um, CDC partner. Or, or, or is that open? Like, yeah, that's not my that's interpretation. Right. Sorry, it sounds like it's very nuanced, but next. Um, what if an organization provides human services resources, such as producing boxes from other organizations, but would like to open their own cooperative grocery store? Um, so I think the answer would be that's a great project that we would welcome um, helping to th think about a collaboration with healthcare. The organization, though, would either need to be a community development corporation or a nonprofit that does bigger infrastructure work. So I think the answer would be you would probably need to partner with that type of organization, which could be helpful if you're trying to create a cooperative grocery store because they know a lot of the real estate um, world and community development could be a ready partner for that type of work. So you mm -hmm. might want to try to do in partnership. And so Amanda's question is around uh, perinatal racial equity awareness, engaging academic institutions, primary care providers and communities. Um, would we be able to apply again, super important work around, um, you know, perinatal care and those kind of uh, disparities, but it's not really eligible for this kind of grant. Um, because it's a service 
uh, uh, individual focused. Yeah. And Drew's asking, what about non-traditional CDCs that don't do housing development, but focus on community organizing, policy advocacy, as well as developing community ownership through urban farms, farmers markets, and worker cooperatives? If you are a community development corporation and you're doing this type of policy organizing work, yes, yes, you can apply. Um, we have a whole, we have a policy scan that we recently completed um, and really believe in the, the larger systems change work. And, um, and the whole goal of this is to advance collaboration between community development and healthcare. So if you're a community development organization, yes. Uh, Diane says we are a nonprofit Anchorage in Anchorage, sorry, and we are building an, a BIPOC equity center. And as part of that, we'll have a small business incubator. And we're also working on a COVID grant. We are looking to partner with Providence Health System here. Would we qualify? Abs absolutely. I mean, if if you're um, a partner, if you're building your BIPOC equity center with a CDC, um, that's a uh, 501c3, um, I think that would be a strong, you know, uh, application. So the next question, hi, Jason, is are fiscally sponsored organizations eligible? We are sponsored by 5013C, but don't have our own status. Yes, if you're fiscally sponsored by an organization to get your 5013 status, that, that yes, we can, we can work with that. We just need some way of, um, being able to have another entity to be able to do the grant process with. So yes, Jason. Hi, Emily, it's nice to hear from you. Um, can you talk a little more about the goal of the program to build capacity of organizations to undertake community ownership models? How do you define community ownership model? Are and are participating organizations required to pursue community ownership model as their strategy or is it acceptable to pursue a membership with a healthcare organization using your own upstream strategies? Great question. I'll, I'll answer the, the last part first. Um, you don't have to be pursuing community ownership models to apply if you have other upstream measures that you wanna work on with healthcare organizations. As long as uh, community is integrated into that process in a meaningful way, way that's, not, that's not necessarily a requirement. For community ownership models, I think our definition is thinking about ways that you're creating strategies and models that allow ownership, allow the community to actually own the, the whatever the project is. So if it's a co-op grocery store, if it's a community land trust, um, if it's thinking about other type of co-op working establishments, um, those type of projects where the community eventually will be the owner in some capacity, in some way. The idea is moving assets from a private, a public entity and into the community to give more control and power and voice. Ruth, would you add anything mm -hmm. else there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the organization that applies needs to be working in housing, um, not just housing, no. Housing is just a lot of times community development corporations work on housing, but it could also be uh, as someone voiced a non-traditional community development corporation that does more community organizing and policy. Um, still thinking about infrastructure change it does not ne necessarily have to be housing. It could be community centers you're building, grocery right. stores. Yes. Other aspects of the built environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sharon's asking, our nonprofit does workforce development and economic develop empowerment, and we've established an apprenticeship program with our local healthcare and community college alliances. Are we eligible to apply? Um, I, I don't know. If you are a CDC um, that's doing some of that work, um, you might be. Um, it's a little hard to comment just on that. Yeah, again, I think if you're a community development corporation doing yeah. infrastructure work, either the bricks and mortar or policy, yes. Um, I mean, as I said, we, you know, we've got the economic playbook, which has CDCs that are doing some of that work and partnering with healthcare. It's a great examples in there. Um, so I think that's all I'd say. Uh, Lisa is asking, what would be, well, two questions. What would be project example for workforce development? Would a Metro Housing Authority be eligible to apply? 
I think the project example, we have a whole playbook on economic yeah. development. And one project example in that is in Spartanburg, South Carolina, a large healthcare system partnered with uh, a nonprofit organization and helped them actually purchase land to build housing. And then that ended up being co-located with a workforce training center um, where the hospital is actually the one doing the training to train people on construction and how to be uh, construction workers because Spartanburg is going through um, a high peak in population growth and development and needs construction workers. So that's a great program where community development organization came together to work with a healthcare entity to really create change, um, both on the housing front and then co-located with this workforce training program. And would a Metro Housing Authority be eligible to apply? Um, I, at least I don't think on your own, I think it would need to be in partnership with a community-based organization that's working on revitalization efforts. Okay, so Thomas says uh, three questions. Gosh, great, I love the organization in, in a row. We are a CDC that connects dots between public health, education and housing. Uh, we love to hear it, that's wonderful. Um, if we win, can we use the funds to hire a public health expert instead of hire a consultant? And if we're already doing work trying to connect dots, are we eligible for, or only if we're thinking about this the first time? And is it required to partner with a hospital or public health entity? Um, so I, I can go through, um, I don't know, I hadn't thought about, I don't know about, can you hire a public health consultant? I don't think there's a restriction on what the consultant is that you hire with the money. Um, if we're doing the work already, um, are you eligible? Yes, I think that people along different parts of the spectrum of that journey um, are eligible to apply. So if you already have a relationship, but you have plans or growth or ambitions for that relationship to, to further it, um, that could be that could be an application. And are you required to partner with a hospital or public health entity? The end result, yes. I mean, you don't, as we said, some people on here will not have that relationship and they can still apply. Um, but the end result is to look, is to create um, a strategy to get those partnerships for the project. So um, the last number three is kind of a yes. Yeah. But you don't have to have it up front. Great. Um, I can go to the next one. I don't know if we're going to get to all of these. So yeah, I have more questions. I'm trying to skip through. But one is if we're building a grocery store, do we need a healthcare industry partner? So as Ruth was saying, you don't need a healthcare partner to begin with, but you will have, there has to be a desire to partner with healthcare to build that grocery store. And we have a whole case study on a bunch of healthcare systems who have invested in grocery stores. So it's a great project idea. The next one um, about neighborhood revitalization work. You want to uh, help other unincorporated com um, committees getting organized. Yes, if you're a CDC doing that type of work, um, yes, you you are eligible to apply. Um, I'm going to so come back. There was a question about outcomes. I'm trying to skip down if there's um, yeah. Oh, is, uh, is clearing land that is owned by the CDC used for community development an eligible expense for this grant? Eligible expense. Well, um, the 40,000 is a stipend that's given to create um, capacity to be able to form this uh, healthcare partnership. So I'm not sure um, what you're describing is something that has, is in the, is it in part of the process of that? It doesn't sound like it. So I would yeah. say no. And then uh, Matthew's asking about a private foundation as lead. Again, you would need to partner with a community development corporation in order to be eligible. Um, so some of these questions are about that, I think. Um, and then Lisa's asking about the playbook. As long as we have your email address, um, we can also, Lara, could you could you find it and put it in the chat for everyone? Oh, um, I just I just did put the uh, economic playbook in the chat. Um, great, folks saw that. And then this question about um, the the forty thousand dollars. That's how you, to, for you to use how you'd like. If you wanted to cover your staff time, if you wanted to 
cover a consultant, that $40,000 is up to how you would like to use it. We're completely flexible. Um, we, 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 uh, there's a question about consider funding a CDFI. And I think for this cohort, it is focused on community development corporations. Um, so unfortunately not at this time, although we really like to partner with CDFIs and would be happy to talk yeah. to you offline about your needs around that. Uh, Denise, yes, to clarify these grants, uh, are focused on upstream initiatives you outlined, not the downstream ones, correct? Yes, this is about creating a strategy um, to develop an upstream intervention. Uh, and I'm just checking the chat. There's a couple here. Um, if we partnered with the CDC to build affordable housing specifically for teachers in our teacher diversity program, would that qualify? Um, if, if if you're actively partnering with CDC, I mean, I'm not sure it's not something you've just done in the past, but you have an active partnership and the CDC is applying for this money to um, bring in a health entity uh, to help fund something. That would qualify. Okay, I think. There's a lot of questions about if a health entity could apply or a small medical center. Again, I think you would need to partner with a community development corporation in order to apply. And I know someone asked if you want to partner with a community development corporation, could you apply? And I think the goal would be to go ahead and try to figure out that the, the beginning of that partnership and apply together. And you're welcome to, um, we actually have a space on our website too to find community development corporations in your community. Um, so I'll be sure to follow up with an email with these resources that we mentioned, and we want to be as helpful as possible. Yeah. Okay. I think that addresses the anonymous question about if you have an interest in partnering with a, C, a CDC. Um, um, I guess we can okay. add it through. I think that we're... We're almost at time. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if we can... Um, if we've, we've covered we've answered a lot of questions but have we yeah. covered if there's one that you feel like hasn't been covered and you want to just share it in, in the chat as a last minute a type of question that we haven't um, addressed maybe we can quickly squeeze that in but as Colleen said we'll be sharing um, a sort of a packet of information really with some of these links in an email um, for those of you that have registered um, so I um, I think, uh, you know, <laughs> it's hard to answer all these questions. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, Alencia says one, my organization is not a CDC. Um, the only CDC in our community folded 15 years ago. Therefore, we provide community development activities and programming where we can. This exemplifies, exemplifies a particular need and nuance to truly disadvantaged community, communities. So would we be eligible to apply? So I think there, again, if you're a nonprofit, you don't have to necessarily be a community development corporation um, because we want to be open to nonprofits that might be aiming to becoming community development corporations. So if you're a nonprofit that's doing infrastructure work in your community, like helping to build grocery stores, affordable housing, community centers, also providing some potentially job training, advocacy, then, then yes, we definitely don't want to... Um, negate organizations that don't have community development corporations in their community. So I just want to squeeze in a thank you to everyone at the end here um, for sticking with us through the hour and uh, asking so many really great questions and we're really grateful for your interest uh, and excitement and energy around this uh, application. Really looking forward to seeing your applications coming in. Um, yeah, thank you for the robust, the robust Q and A. It's it's been lovely to see all your questions and just appreciate the opportunity to share um, this RFP with all of you. And we hope yeah. we get lots of great applications. And one other thing I wanted to mention that I'll include in the email is that we do have a survey we're asking organizations to fill out so we can learn through this process. We're always wanting to learn and reflect, um, and I will share that in the. Um, actually, maybe I'll just share that in the chat and then also in the email. Um, because that's another opportunity to learn more about you and your needs. Um, I'm just trying to find the link really quickly. Okay. Um, I'll provide it in the email. 
since we're at the hour, I know that everyone needs to go. Thank you all. Thank you. for Great. Your time. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Take care. Look forward to seeing your applications. Take care. Bye.